good morning, almost good afternoon. My name is Jim Levinson. Uh, I'm the director of the Jackson Institute uh, here at Yale. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody who's here as well as welcome our audience as this is being live streamed as I understand around the world. One of the things that we do at Jackson that is a little bit different is that in addition to traditional academic faculty in our classrooms, we bring in our senior fellows who are people who have really impacted the world around us. And it's an amazing compliment to the more traditional approach to thinking about issues at a university. I can't think of a better example um, of, of how we've, we, we've, we've done this. Uh, we're privileged to have with us today uh, former Secretary of State John Kerry, uh, retired General Stan McChrystal, to have a conversation about uh, Afghanistan. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. You turn it over to me first, sorry. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a great privilege to be back here uh, at Yale. Um, as a veteran of 28 years in the United States Senate, I guess it's nice to be invited anywhere. <laughs> but uh, It's particularly good to be here. And I'm honored to be here with uh, General McChrystal, who I admire enormously. I think all of you know he's a soldier, soldier, and uh, one of the best, uh, as Bob Gates said, one of the great warriors uh, of our time. So I'm really happy to be here with you. And I, we, we crossed paths in uh, Afghanistan, uh, and I may have crossed paths with a couple of you here over the course of time. But this is, a, this is an important conversation, and, and I'm really pleased to take part in it with all of you because uh, we're living in a very dangerous world, a world of enormous upheaval and complexity. Uh, some of the choices that we face in terms of public policy uh, are just not as clear-cut as they were, I think, often during the course of the Cold War where it was pretty bipolar and um, uh, we were in a different kind of driver's seat back then with options playing out differently in many ways. Uh, and the clarity of the weaponry and the tools available to various players uh, were considerably different uh, with the Soviet Union, with the tampening down of much of the sectarianism and uh, uh, religious uh, components of life. Uh, and, you know, a person like Tito in Yugoslavia could just quash it, and they sat on it. But when the Berlin Wall came down, a whole bunch of forces that had been compressed by virtue of totalitarianism and the divisions of the world suddenly were released. And that's been an explosion that we've had to deal with, all of us, in pub public policy terms. Uh, I happen to come to this table with a very, very deep belief in uh, special force, special ops capacity. Um, it's no secret that I was one of the, the strongest but yet unsuccessful advocates for much greater special force deployment during the course of early days of Syria because I thought it would have tipped the balance and I thought we would have had a different outcome. And I also was extremely impatient with the way in which we approached destruction of ISIS because I thought every day that ISIS was alive, that narrative was a dangerous narrative and it underscored the sort of impotence and reluctance of the Western world uh, to do what we have to do and what we've ultimately done. I had no doubts when we put together the coalition, which I put together, um, uh, that we were going to succeed, um, never a doubt. But there were an awful lot of lives lost, an awful lot of uh, communities disrupted, an awful lot of narrative created by virtue of the delay uh, in using the force and capacity that we have. And I'm not talking about putting special forces into 
harm's way in the context that you're in harm's way the minute you're there. But I wasn't talking about clearing the streets of Raqqa or doing any of that. I thought we would have organized the YPG, done a lot more that we could have done, done it faster. I think we could have even, perhaps even built a larger Arab contingency on the ground to do things for us. Uh, and we should have done it. Uh, and and it's, uh, you know, I, I ache for Syria and what is there today as a consequence of the reluctance to take action. And as you all know, I stood up pretty clearly and boldly on a Tuesday, I think it was, and talked about what we we're going to do in Syria, and then we wound up by a Friday not, not you know, making a different choice. And to some, some degree, David Cameron uh, screwed that up by going to Parliament and losing, which we had no idea he was going to do. I mean, that just blindsided us. Um, and we were on a phone call with about 100 members of Congress on a Friday in the morning, uh, many of whom were saying, well, are you going to come to us? You know, look at what Cameron did. We're a democracy. We have to respect that process and so forth. Uh, notwithstanding that, well, you know, I think we had a different set of options. But let me come back to the premise that I just put on the table, special ops. Uh, I, I learned a long time ago, and I was not a special I mean, we were kind of special ops in what we were doing in Vietnam. But we weren't trained as special ops operators. We were, we were sort of self-taught as we went along. A lot of improvisation as we were going up and down the rivers of the Delta. Uh, with a lot of SEAL teams and, uh, you know, rain, we had Delta Force, other people with us, Army, special ops, and so forth. But we were pretty much improvisational. But I learned, you know, it's just much better to sneak up on people, folks, like hide and seek and capture the flag. Uh, you know. Quick in, quick out. It's easier to be the guerrilla. It's easier to be the uh, the insurgent. And I think we see the difficulties of trying to fight back against insurgencies. Law enforcement, military, homeland security, all these folks, you got to get it right 24-7, 365. If you're a bad guy, you only have to get it right for an hour, 10 minutes, or at chosen moments along the way. And it is a hell of a lot harder uh, to have a prophylactic uh, blanket of some kind that's going to protect you all the time. We've done an amazing job. I am in awe of what we have been able to accomplish across the board in breaking up things and making things happen. But I may be wrong. Uh, there's always room for error in human judgment. But I don't think we are looking at a world in which in the near term we're going to have uh, World War III or major conflict, obviously you have to be prepared. Obviously you have to have a deterrent capacity that is meaningful, and deterrence is real. It, it, there's, there really are definitions of where you get your deterrence from. But uh, we're just not, uh, you know, other than Putin violating all international norms by doing what he did in Crimea and screwing around in the eastern part of uh, Donbass, um, the reassurance program we put in place for the frontline states has worked. And the $4 billion we put on the line and the additional divisions we deployed and the tanks we put on the ground, that's worked. And uh, as, as dangerous as the world is, I don't think Putin or Kim Jong-un are looking for annihilation. So there are always going to be these calculated uh, steps, but extremists are different. Terrorists are different. They don't think that way. They're ready to give up their lives. They don't care about dying. Dying's better for many of them. That's a different kind of enemy, and it's a different kind of concept that you have to deal with. And there, the battle is going to be, and I think it's there for the long term, by the way, special forces is going to be the key to our ability to be safe and to be able to do what we need to do to protect ourselves and to help our allies and to stand by people. Again and again and again, whether it's Boko Haram or Al-Shabaab or Al-Qaeda or uh, you know, a group of crazy loony people who've come together in Libya now and are spreading out into uh, Nigeria and Mali and so forth, that's a fight that's real. And it is a threat that is real. And it's going to remain a threat for the foreseeable future. Meanwhile, incomprehensibly, in my judgment, we have a group of people who have allowed 
a, a persistent ideological uh, uh, group of, of folks to kind of hijack real thinking about where the world is going in terms of uh, defense policy and, and threats. And the result of that is, I was just at the Munich Security Conference and we had a, uh, na we had a national threat initiative group of folks who were there. Sam Nunn, who you all know, and Sam's very thoughtful on this. Ernie Moniz, who uh, as the Energy Secretary had responsibilities for our nuclear weapons and so forth. And a lot of veterans of H.W. Bush and George W. Bush and so forth, a bipartisan group, non-ideological, all of whom expressed deep concern, which I share, uh, for the direction of our national security uh, and, and defense posture that was articulated recently. I mean, how can you have a posture on, on defense that is actually respecting the needs of our nation that doesn't even mention climate change? You can't, but it does, doesn't mention it. Moreover, it's talking in terms of sort of unilateral modernization of the nuclear arsenal. Uh, but believe me, I know we need to modernize some. We, we, there are things we have to do in terms of uh, warheads and capacity that provide you with assurance that your deterrent is strong and going to stay where it needs to be. But we're on an automatic pilot, folks, to a new arms race with the potential loss of the INF Treaty and the potential loss of the uh, START Treaty, which Ronald Reagan helped us put in place when he said with Gorbachev meeting in Reykjavik, this is insane. We got 50,000 warheads pointed at each other. That's where we were. We went in the other direction, folks. We're down to 1550 or something in that vicinity. And we could go lower reasonably and ought to try to. Because every step you take in a world where you're trying to reduce the capacity for a nuclear confrontation actually makes the world safer. Because it means you're reducing the capacity for mistake, you're reducing the capacity for stupidity, you're reducing, uh, the, uh, you're, you're reducing better, better said, you are changing the way in which you approach conflict resolution and you're hopefully resolving conflicts in, in better and more effective ways. So I, I think we're in a very tricky place right now, to be honest with you. Um, and as Bob Gates used to remind everybody again and again, uh, you know, if, you, if you're not prepared to invest in diplomacy, if you're not prepared to do what you need to do to reduce threats in other ways, you better provide more bullets so to speak, to the Defense Department. And we've grown smarter about that. I remember when I was in Afghanistan, I went up into Kunar province and, and uh, man, I tell you, this Navy captain, or his commander, uh, was the head of the operation up there. And I was as impressed as I have ever been by a military briefing anywhere at any time by this young guy who was philosopher, mayor, psychologist, uh, development director, governor, and soldier all at the same time. It was absolutely stunning. He knew every tribe. He knew every tribal leader. He knew them by name. He knew who was who, what the interrelationship was, what he had to do to work this. It was as fine as you get and better than any agency briefer or State Department briefer in Washington, D.C. That's what we have developed today. That's what you all have developed today. You deserve enormous credit for it. But we're not putting it to proper use. And we're not supporting the interrelationship between the kinetic capacity that you need and the prevention and development capacity and the governance capacity. And I spent hours with Karzai and hours with Abdullah Abdullah and with Ghani to get them to be a government. I mean, twice I had to get uh, Karzai first, off, we have to get a status of forces agreement and we had to move forward on an election that he wasn't accepting. And that was one round and then we had another round when Ghani came in and they were all doubting the election and we couldn't get a government and I negotiated that and we got a government. So I, I'm pretty aware of the challenges of governance in Afghanistan. But you know, I, I, 
Afghanistan, I say this to people all the time, it is not Vietnam. And we have to stop thinking of everything generationally and otherwise in terms of it always you know, being Vietnam. It's not. But it's moving in the wrong direction if we don't do more to deal with the corruption, deal with the governance challenge, deal with the capacity of the forces to actually provide security and move out into the communities, reduce the heroin production, 90% of that, three billion bucks a year to insurgency. And we're paying for part of the insurgency. Part of the Taliban are getting money from the money we're putting in there because they got all these deals and the Afghan government turns our money over to the Taliban who then agree not to attack them here or there and you get these unholy relationships. And it's complicated, as you know better than anybody. But given what's happening with Iran and with Russia and the proxy component of this, not to mention the fact that, you know, when we started this operation in 2001, there were eight, 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 what, 800,000 people in school in Afghanistan, and they were almost all boys. Now you've got 8 million plus, and 45% or so are girls. And they started when they were 10 years old, and now they're 20-something. I mean, that's change in the making. And you think of 10 years, 15, what, 17 years we've been there now. So for 16 or 15 of those 17 years, you got a young generation coming up who are going to be educated, who have a different attitude, who want a different future. You can't just walk away from that. You can't just suddenly say to them, you know, we're going to disinvest in this. Plus, the reason we went there originally was to prevent ungoverned spaces from being able to attack us again. And given what's happening in Pakistan, with the Haqqani network and the ISI and that unholy relationship and a whole lot of other difficulties we face, it is pretty critical for us to remain vigilant and have a sufficient level of a platform that you're able to perform. And as I know Stan believes, if you don't have people on the ground, folks, you don't have intel. You won't know what's going on. So you've got to have a sufficient level to have enough intel to know who you're trying to target and who you're trying to stop and what you're trying to do. So there are a bunch of reasons why I am, a, I'll wrap this up, why I'm a big believer in, in special ops and in getting the larger picture right in terms of where we spend the money, why we spend the money, what we're spending it on and what we're doing with an understanding that we're going to have to be ready to help people in certain parts of the world or to go in and attack some people and take them out on short notice uh, because they represent a clear and present danger and a threat. And that's going to go on for quite a while, I'm afraid, because we got a lot of folks out there for whom in this world of media, of, of social media, of knowing what everybody in the world has and what they're doing and not sharing in it, eight, what is it, we got two billion people between the ages of 15 and, and 24, mischief age, I call it. We have, you know, a billion eight people between the age of 15 and zero, you know, uh, and about 400 million of them are not going to go to school. I know a lot of Americans don't think that's our problem, but I do. I think that's part of the security threat. And I'll tell you an apocryphal story about why I think that. I went to a country in northern Africa, it'll remain nameless, in the early part of my tour as secretary, and I sat down with my counterpart, the foreign minister, who's still playing a role in the international scene. And we went out to dinner, and, and I said to him, you know, about 40%, 35% uh, of the country is Muslim. And I said, how are you managing your minority population? What are you, what are you doing to sort of shape the future? And he said, you know, John, we're terrified. We try to do what we can within the limits of our resources and our capacity. But he said, but you know, the bad guys, the extremists, have, are, are targeting 12 and 13 and 14 year old kids. And they take them away from the family. They pay them a stipend. And they take them into their school and, and they indoctrinate them. They completely turn their heads into becoming acolytes. And then they don't have to pay them anymore, he said. They send them out back into the community to become recruiters. And these are your future organizers, your future suicide vests, and so forth. 
And, and he said, you know, um, this is the sentence that hit me uh, that was so critical. He said, John, they have a 35-year plan, and they're patient as hell and disciplined as hell, and we don't even have a five-year plan. That's our problem. And that's where special operations are going to be so critical to us, and intel gathering is going to be so critical to us, and our ability. We're going to win. I, I believe that. But it's like climate change. We're going to get to a carbonless, better, sustainable energy policy. The question is, are we going to get there fast enough? And that's the question with respect to terrorism. Are we going to let Nigeria fall apart? Are we going to let the DRC you know, shred? Are we going to allow these dictators to break their constitutions and go for third terms and destroy rule of law? Or are we going to be sufficiently investing in these places, not because it's, you know, do-gooder, goo-goo, tree-hugging, whatever you want to call it, but because it's in our interest. That's how we're going to build our security. That's how we're going to protect ourselves. Know what's happening in the world. Know who is plotting. Know who is buying weapons. Know who is funding uh, illicit activities. And, and be able to join in partnership with countries all around the world and present a significant enough front that the world is convinced that our leadership is important, that we mean to lead, and that we are prepared to stand up and fight for our principles, not wince and not go south and not suddenly turn to the world and say, hey, this is too much for us. We're, we're moving away from a world order that brilliant people put together in the aftermath of World War II and a century that took tens of millions of lives because we didn't do the kinds of things we needed to build structure and build rule of law and live by some values and principles. And I think special operations is, to me, really, uh, and I, anybody who was with me in the State Department or knew what I said in the Senate as chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, I've always argued that's the real tip of the spear. That's the place we've got to start. That's the place where we could accomplish enormously, uh, enormously important goals. And we've got to factor it in more effectively to this macro uh, shaping of a strategy to deal with the world that we're living in today. Not the world we wish we had, not the world we had before, but the world we're actually living in today. So that's a longer introduction than I meant to give you, but there it is. I, I know my role up here today, it's to dumb down the conversation so some of you can understand it. Um, well, if I'd known the, the uniform of the day oh, was yes, blue jeans, guys, I'd have showed up differently. Huh? It's, uh, no, it's an, it's an honor, sir, and, and uh, we don't have that many people in the country thinking these days about anything. We've got a lot of people communicating, but not many people thinking. And to, to be next to someone who's been thinking a long time and, and is able to articulate, it's a real honor. Um, there are a lot of people in the, uh, the room here today that I have special relationships. Some of you are in my class, uh, so you have to cheer because you're not, your grades aren't final. Um, <laughs> and then there are a whole bunch of people here that I served with, either very directly or indirectly, and, and I appreciate that. So I owe you something, and so I'm going to start by just giving some advice. And I'm going to give some advice on retirement, because retirement is not bad. <laughs> First, you've got to decide where you're going to live but it's pretty easy because your spouse will decide that. So you just go there. The second thing, you got to get a kegerator, and that, that's, that enables everything else. You then have got to start thinking about what you did. And I'll be honest with you here, I've spent now seven and a half years since I, uh, I left the service thinking about what I did and second guessing. And not being false humble here, there were a lot more things that I got wrong and we got wrong than I ever realized or wanted to admit. There are a lot of things, they weren't sins of commission, they were things we didn't know. We just didn't understand. And we, we walked in with a very limited view and therefore we tried to, to interpret that well enough to act and do some pretty big actions that had big implications and we were ignorant. Not evil, but ignorant, and there was huge cost to that. And then the, the other thing you do as you uh, in retire, you watch the people that you served with and you see what they do after you leave. And that's a source of huge pride. 
you know, when I see Mike Nagata and Scotty Miller and, and the others of you, and I see what you have done and what you've become, it's, it's pretty humbling. But I also see what you have in front of you, what you've already done for now almost 20 years, and what you have in front of you, that is, uh, that's a huge challenge. I thought what I'd do is, I, there's no way I, I can add much to what the Secretary said about the world in general. So I'll, I'll bring it down and sort of just throw my view on that Afghanistan part to it. I, I remember going in and I spent a lot of time with President Karzai because that was my job. And so I'd go spend a lot of time and you don't really make great progress until you spend a lot of time with someone because there's a certain, everybody's got their talking points and then after that you're just talking and then at some point you start telling the truth. And he used to repeatedly, we'd be sitting there after a while and he'd go, Stan, why is America in Afghanistan? And I'd look at him, because we'd been through this, you know, I'd kind of roll my eyes, but the first time I remember saying, hey, and I'd go through what we're trying to do, and he says, no, there is no way you are here to make Afghanistan a more stable place. That doesn't make sense, that's nonsensical. You have a greater strategic goal to have a base in this part of the world to do this, this, and so you can stair step to other places. And, you know, I'd look at him and I'd say, no, I'd like to tell you we do, but if we do, it has not been shared with me. We actually are, are thinking much more narrowly and much more short term than that. And that really gets at the heart of, I think, how we think about <laughs> Afghanistan. I would start by if you go back to our relationship with Afghanistan, it's sort of been stop and start. Up until the 1970s, they were an interesting country that people would go to and visit, and that was no big problem. Then in 73, it started to fall into the perception that was in the Soviet sphere, and so that was worrisome, with Daoud taking over the government and whatnot. And then when the Soviets went in on, at Christmas 1979, Remember, that was only six weeks after the American embassy in Tehran had been seized. So against that backdrop, against that Cold War backdrop, against a lot of other things happening, American, America not having a good 1970s, uh, suddenly it looked different. And so we went through the Afghan war and, uh, with the Soviets, and we provided money and, and uh, weapons. And at the end of that war, there was that famous fax the CIA element did, said, we won. And we sort of beat our chest and we said, they had their Vietnam, now we won. And then we sort of packed up and came home, went on to other things. And the Afghans, not all of them, but a lot of them said, now wait a minute, we just lost 1.2 million Afghans fighting against your Cold War enemy, who you've never fought, which is true point. We just lost 1.2 million and now you're leaving and said, hey, we helped you, we enabled it, we gave you money and arms. And they go, really? For 1.2 million killed. And so there was this sort of disbelief that we would turn. And of course, when we turn away, their, their first fear, of course, is Pakistan. And there's, there's great reason for that. So you have an abandonment mentality. And then through the, the 1990s, as they tore themselves apart with civil wars, and it was really hellish. We paid no attention to it, but it was just really difficult what happened in much of Afghanistan during the 1990s. Then the, the Taliban came in and that led to another uh, series of dramatic events. So that when 2001 happened and the towers went down and we as a nation sort of looked back again at that part of the world and we said, ah, Al Qaeda came from there, we gotta go there, we gotta get there now, and we gotta, we gotta take control of that particular threat. And so we, we came back in, the Afghans, I think took another look and said, okay, we understand that. We overthrew the Taliban government. And then they stood <clears throat> and waited, all right, now you're gonna help. Now we're gonna sort this place out. And there really were, pretty lofty expectations. I was there in the spring of 2002, and there was great expectations, and the level of actual commitment was just extraordinarily small. I think $100 million was, uh, or $1 million was put against the Army initially. 
I, I was part of 18th Airborne Corps, and they said, we're going to reorganize a whole new Afghan army. And I'm a chief of staff, 18th Airborne Corps, and they, they said, what are we going to arm them with? They said, well, we'll pull stuff out of the caves. And of course, the stuff we had pulled out of the caves was not usable. So we got 600 Romanian AK-47s donated, and we thought this is a big deal. But that's not how you build an army. You build an army with institutions, with training and, and whatnot. So there was this, and then we were matched by the Italians and Germans with the courts and the police with an effort that was on paper, but in reality didn't, didn't accomplish or didn't amount to much. So in reality, you had this gap between what the Afghan people hoped and expected in, in the uh, aftermath of the fall of the Taliban and what they saw. And many of them, their great fear was warlords would come back into power because the reason the Taliban had had some popularity is they'd swept the warlords out. And then what happened was, of course, the warlords in many areas, they came right in, they filled in. Some of them spoke English or they were clever people. And we, including many of us in this room, we failed to take the long view and we got expedient. We dealt with the person who was most available and could do it. And so we, we worked with a lot of people and we empowered a lot of people that sort of circle back around to be painful over time. So where are we now? We're now, you know, almost two decades past that. Uh, situation's still difficult. I agree with the Secretary, it's not Vietnam. I also don't buy into the graveyard of empires thing. If we fail in Afghanistan, we failed. We can't go back and say, no, no, it's, it's factors bigger than anyone can do. It's because we didn't do it right. We've done sort of the stop and start on things. I'm a great believer that we have got to take a long view of these things. The short-term view of dropping a bomb or killing somebody is necessary in the short term sometimes, but it never solves the problem. People say, why can't we get back to World War II when we didn't have to do messy counterinsurgency? And I'll tell you, we did do counterinsurgency in World War II. We just did it after the fact. The Marshall Plan was counterinsurgency. It was prevention of something that would be horrific, and we invested in it, and we actually, it came out pretty well. What we've got to do in places like Afghanistan, in my view, is it's pretty basic, and for people looking for the clever plan, I don't have one. It's first, understand the place. I remember when Scotty Miller came to my office in 2000, late 2008 or early 2009, and he said, we need to form Afghan hands. We need to get a bunch of American military and diplomats who speak the language, go there repetitively, know people, and have real relationships. We've tried to do that, and unfortunately, there's been pretty tepid support from the services to getting that right. But we should have done that years and years ago, and at the latest, we should have done it September 12, 2001. So that was sort of one thing. The next thing is, you got to decide what your relationship with the area is. It would have been better for me to be able to tell Hamid Karzai, yeah, we do have a strategic view, and a strategic view is we do want a base here, whether we really want that or not. Therefore, we're invested in this, so we got to sort this government out because we're going to be on the ground here for, for the foreseeable future, decades. If the Afghan people, when I got there in 2009, the thing I, that really shocked me is the greatest deficit there was confidence. They thought we were going to leave. They thought the Afghan government was going to fall. Everybody was hedging their bets because everybody thought this was a Jenga tower and it wasn't going to hold up. And as long as people think that, they don't invest, they don't make the commitments and whatnot. So our inability to convince people we're long-term strategic partners weakens us dramatically. And it, of course, emboldens your foes. Now, I know we don't want to make long-term commitments around the world, because but you don't have to put that much there. Remember the great statement, I think it was at the beginning of the, the uh, First World War, the British asked the French how many troops they needed. They said, just send us one guy and we'll make sure he gets killed, because then you'll be invested. As long as we can convince people that we're invested. Cars, I used to say, I, I remember when I, were, I was pushing him to accept more troops so we could get a level of security. He says, I want more Americans. I said, well, good. Discussion's over. He says, no, I want business people. I want you to invest here so that you are invested and therefore you, you care how this place comes out. And I don't think we've been able to convince people of that. And, and part of that is how we talk about it, how we deal with it. So to get to the 
to sort of the punchline of all this, special operating forces are going to have to be really uh, joined at the hip with our di diplomats. And that includes intelligence people and whatnot. But I'm, our non-military solution and the special operating forces are going to have to be out there. And you're going to have to speak the language. You're going to have to know people. And that's going to take a lot of time and a lot of pain. And we're going to have to spend time in places where there's not a war, but there could be at some point. And that's, you know, that's sometimes dreary and painful, but the, uh, the payoff on that is just extraordinary in the long term. If we could do that, I think we'd prevent a lot and we'd make short work of some of the uh, things that have been really difficult for us thus far. Can I ask you a couple questions? Yes, sir. As we dig into this conversation. Sure. Um, in 20, we went in in 2001, 20, and we went in and we gave the Taliban a choice you're with us, you're with them. And so in 2001, we started to do what we started to do. To what degree, well, first of all, let me just repeat. In 2010, there was a soldier, I don't, I don't, I don't remember the name, who was asked about the war there. And he said, well, it's actually, you know, we, we, it's been eight wars. We just do the same thing every year. We do have a new round of the same thing. And the question is whether Given what you know now, and having been through what you went through, when we went in in 2001, um, I remember having this conversation with General Keene. I was, I was outraged that we had Osama bin Laden in the Tora Bora Mountains, and I think our special ops guys were at the base of the mountain listening to him. The New York Times was covering stories of that. We uh, never sent them up. They never went in. They were chomping at the bit. They thought it could get Osama bin Laden right then and there. And I asked General Keene uh, outside the Senate one day, we bumped into each other, and I said, what the hell happened there? What is the story? I said, why didn't we do that? And he said, risk aversion. That was his answer to me. There, the, I guess the president was thinking in terms of having a war like Clinton had with Bosnia, Kosovo, no casualties. And so we didn't go in. And the chase went on, and our platform grew. Could we have had a smaller platform with a different strategy when we went in 2001? We did what we needed to do, but we never needed to buy the country. We, we went in there to protect ourselves against ungoverned spaces, the danger of the Osama bin Ladens. Could, so two questions, really. Could we have taken him out there earlier and had a different set of options if we had? not been so risk averse, number one. And number two, could we have simply had a different platform and said, we're going to be more limited, we can protect America this way, but we don't have to take over the country and try to defy, you know, a country that's 400 years behind everybody else in the world. No, that's it. And those are two good questions. The first one is, we went in in the fall of 2001, primarily with CIA and money, and then some special forces a little bit later. Um, and the Taliban fell so much faster than everybody thought that it was this sort of shock. And people said, okay, this is the new way of war. We work through partners. We enable partners with air power and intelligence and funding, and they do the work. And okay, we've figured this out. This is not that hard. Then you get to a problem like Tora Bora, where they don't have the capacity. There are special forces there with Afghans, but they didn't have the capacity to root Al Qaeda out of the Tora Bora area. You needed something more. And because of the geography of that area, sealing the border with Pakistan is just probably impossible. I think that the, the Pakistanis estimated tens of thousands of troops would be required. And then the request was made to put American Rangers in and do that. Now that might have worked, but we were on this decision that said, no, no, this is my perception of it. No, no, we figured out that we only work, you know, we work through the local warlords and whatnot. And so it didn't work in, in Tora Bora, and everybody goes, wow, okay. Then we were at this position where you've got Afghanistan, you've toppled the Taliban government, and the Afghan people are going, okay, what now? You just topple the government. And the Northern Alliance had primary control, but there were seven competing groups. And so it almost at that point is a moral issue. It gets to what Colin Powell said, you know, you break it, you buy it. And we're sort of there. So I, I think the decision there, we could have pulled out. 
uh, in the fall of 2001, but I think it would have... I don't mean pull out. I mean have a different platform, not pull out. Yeah. But continue to protect the special forces. Yeah. Uh, continue to obviously yeah. protect ourselves against the resurgence, but not have as big a footprint. I, I think we could have kept... Well, first, the footprint was very small for the first few years. 7,500 people. When I was the chief of staff in the fall, in the spring of 2002, we're allowed 7,500 people in the country, and I would have to fly people to Karshi Khanabad for short periods so I could bring other experts in to do, it was stupid, because nobody was counting the, the people, but, and so we did this, and so we, we had a tiny footprint, and our problem was we couldn't decide what it is we were gonna try to do, and, and what we really needed to do, in my view then, was focus on the government of Afghanistan, focus on building right. their security. Yeah. And we did that on the cheap, as I described. And so we didn't make a serious effort to build the Afghan military up. Would have taken actually a bigger footprint than we had in those first couple of years. And then by 2003, what had happened is we'd fallen behind because the expectations were still high. And about 2003, the Taliban, who were shocked, some of them went home to their, wherever they lived in, in Afghanistan, some went to Pakistan, and then about 2003, they see the warlords have gone back in and they go back to villages and they say, well, how's life here? And the villagers go, no, it's, it's terrible because we got this corrupt warlord. So that's when they got. Well, Stan, traction. to what degree, again, I'm just, yeah. and I'm not, this yeah. is not express it. Yeah. I'm trying to dig in and understand better, but to what degree did the rapid diversion of energy in Washington from certain quarters towards Iraq? Oh, yeah. And the entire diversion of our effort into Iraq detract from this war fighting, war planning for Afghanistan itself. I mean, my sense was back then, we didn't have a strategy, we didn't know what we were gonna do, we didn't, and we started going off to find another war. And all of the resources and energy went off to the war we didn't have to fight, the fight of choice, and we left the one that we did have to fight. No, that's exactly right. It, it, I would say, you asked how much, and I'd say completely. And uh, although the forces that I was a part of kept doing stuff, there was never enough of anything in Afghanistan in those next few years. And by 2006, that war had heated up again. And Afghanistan had gotten pretty ugly and we're fighting some pretty short sword fights with not much stuff. Then when I got there in 2009, I, I left Iraq in 2008, went home for a year, got back to Afghanistan, 2009, what shocked me, and I'd been over there for at least a month every year, but, but I got, the real wake-up call when you're in charge, is not only was the footprint in Afghanistan small, but it was the junior varsity. I'll be honest. Um, the, the talent in the military had gone to Iraq. Powerful commanders had been over there and they'd sucked the talent. They had good intel architecture, good communications architecture. When I got to Afghanistan in June of 2009, the intel architecture was terrible. The communications were terrible. You had this really strange command and control setup that we just kind of let go. And to be honest, the staffs were manned by a lot of individual augmentees. And they were good people, but the bottom line is and that's not the same as having people. And in Iraq by 2008 and 9, you had people who'd been there three times. People were really good at what they do. And so it was, we had to start from in Afghanistan again in 2009 from a very low bar, but now we built up a fair amount of callus in the, in the Afghan people, in the press, in the American people. There just wasn't this excitement or confidence to it. And we're, we face that same challenge now, I think. So when we were at max in Afghanistan, I mean, we, I remember there was a point we had 134,000, but didn't we have about 180 at some point? No. Never 180. No. But it was 134. Um, that I'm confident. I was gone before it got to 134. I asked for him, but I wasn't there to wait, welcome them all. Okay. Um, <laughs> but so, that sounds close. So the question is, we now have 14,000. Yeah. Um, differentially, in terms of what you would want to achieve, yeah. we didn't seem to get it done with 134, and now we're working with 14. Uh, can we do what we have to do? Yeah, and that's a great question. And of course, I asked myself this, and you guys have a better view than I do. In 2009, we asked for all those troops, not because we wanted a big footprint, but because the place was about to go down the tubes. And we needed to bridge time to build the Afghan forces. And I didn't want to ask for any more forces. In fact, I went over there thinking we weren't going to ask for any more forces. 
We went through this big analysis, computer runs, all the smart guys on the staff, and they go, we need 40,000 more troops. I go, are you shitting me? I can't ask for 40,000 more troops. They said, hey, look, and we went through a time, and I, General Rodriguez and I were together, we're just pounding on this thing. And then finally we go, hey, you're right. So of course that was a, then we went, met at this secret airfield with Secretary Gates and the chairman and, you know, dropped this one on their front porch. And I remember him going and says, he goes, you're kidding. I said, here's the analysis. Let me take it. We took it through. And he goes, yeah, I think you're right. But boy, they're not going to like this in D.C. I said, yeah, but I don't work in D.C. That's your problem. <laughs> so the bottom line is we, we sent that group over to try to buy time so that we could partner with the Afghan forces to build up. Um, the challenge was that when we put a deadline on it, everybody in their mind said, OK, that deadline. And everybody calculated it differently. There was some good, some people said, great, there's a deadline, and other people said, now we can wait it out. And, and so there's a lot of debate about that. But the bottom line is, I don't think we made enough progress with the Afghan forces to then be able to, to withdraw as fast as we did. There was progress made, no doubt, but, but I don't think we made enough. Now the question of 14,000, it's hard for me to judge. One of the things when people talk about 14,000 troops somewhere, it's not 14,000 barrel-chested freedom fighters you know, out there bayoneting the enemy. I mean, it takes a lot of people just to run the airfield, just to run the hospital, just to do all this kind of stuff. And so you can take 14,000 people before you got one person who's actually out doing anything. And you say, well, that's bad tooth to tail ratio. Okay, I got it. Do you want medevac? Do you want communications? Do you need intelligence? Tell me what you don't want and I'll cut the number down. And so therein lies, you know, another part of the problem. That's why the numbers game is always a challenge. I think, however, that the mission now ought to be twofold. First, sort of be there, meaning we are here. If the Taliban come close to taking it, you're going to have to take us down too. And that's a problem for you, isn't it? The second would be build up Afghan capacity and just stay with the Afghans and stay with them through, you know, generations. I don't have a problem with that. If it's not a huge number of people, What's wrong with having people build them through generations? I actually think being in that part of the world to, to build that kind of stability would be worth it. And it wouldn't be bad for America. Is it uh, worth $45 billion a year? Well, yeah, it's a lot of money. Um, I can't say. I'm really biased on Afghanistan, so you know, discount about half what I say. Cause I, I, don't, I don't think we should discount any of it, because I, I think you know, it's important to figure out what the right mix is here. Yeah. Um, I, and, and the question is, you also have to define winning. Yeah. What is winning? I mean, what's the definition here? Are we chasing the wrong definition of winning? Is the definition of winning the long term that you're talking about, where you have a platform that you know the Taliban can't take over, but you're not pretending you're going to have a government that can deliver X, Y, and Z all the time, and you've got the problems, but we're, we're meeting our needs which has to be the driving force of this thing uh, as a rationale for why you're asking the American people to pay 45 billion bucks and what you're trying to get for it. And we're trying to get security. We're trying to get safety, and ultimately. I, think, I, I don't see any reason with, there's, we can't say that. We, why are you in Afghanistan? Because it's in our interest. There's nothing wrong with that. And I think them being more stable is in our interest. So anything we do to help them. And I think thing. today, given the fact, I mean, one casualty is too many. We all know that. But we are not where we were. And that makes a huge difference to what the American people are prepared to and, and appropriately can, can stick with. Secretary, how would you deal with Pakistan now? <laughs> I never have figured this out. Is the tape on? <laughs> Um, I, it's very hard for me to be fully descriptive uh, with, with, seriously, with the thing I'm a jiggy going there. Uh, I don't want to, um, let me just say this, that I spent hours upon hours upon hours with General Kayani. I probably inhaled more secondary smoke with him. <laughs> <laughs> if I get cancer, I'm blaming the Pakistanis. Um, it wasn't three cups of tea, it was about 3,000 cups of tea. And I went up and down and back and forth working on the ISI issue and the Haqqani network and trying to figure out how we were going to get accountability there. 
Uh, and I finally concluded that I think Pakistan uh, has such a profound tension between its very limited and weak civilian government and the military that it's really not a, a uh, fully blossomed country in the way that we think of it, uh, and it needs to be. Therefore, I think the ISI fundamentally calls its own shots and uh, certainly has very little, if any, civilian control over it. I'm not even sure it has uh, chief of staff of the Army's control over it. And that's a problem. It's a serious problem because you've got the LAT taking steps against India. Uh, you have potential explosion in the cold start slash, uh, you know, ongoing very hot uh, conflict at a sub-level between the insurgents and, the, the, you know, their proxies. I mean, they're working those guys. And the Indians are working people in Afghanistan, <laughs> as you know. Uh, so this is, it's, it's, it's um, an unbelievably duplicitous, unbelievably unmanageable, and extraordinarily disruptive to our goals. I do not think that the current administration's decision just to sort of cut it off is the way to work it. That's not how it works. That's not the psychology out there. It's completely contrary to it. It will make it harder to get visas. It will make it harder to get intel. It will make it harder to, you know, you have to have a certain sophistication as to how you manage the relationship. And it's going to be less than joy every day. You're not gonna, you know, it's not gonna be terrific, but that's not the art is compartmentalizing some of these things and being able to get what you need to the best of your ability. And I think the bombs going off in Kabul are a direct reflection of the just hard ass sort of, we're you know, gonna cut one point whatever billion dollars off of you and you guys, uh, you know, that doesn't work. And you're seeing the, the, I hate the word deep state, but there are deep states. You're seeing that operation come back to, to hurt us right now and to hurt this entire effort. You gotta be really smart and careful about it. So yeah. that's sort of where I see We've it. got the expert of, experts on Pakistan, Mike Nagata. I was afraid you were gonna do this to me, sir. Um, <laughs> Secretary, it's good to see you again. Thank you. I hosted you several times in your visit to Islamabad. Indeed um, you did, and thank you. Years ago. Um, General Crystal sent me for a one-year tour there, ended up being three years, uh, which just meant I, we got to stay there until you get it right. You got to read the small print next time. <laughs> You're overflowing with gratitude. <laughs> um, I, I, my view on this is um, both controversial and a little non-standard in the American government, but here it is. I came to believe in the almost, almost exactly three years I was there um, that the key, that if you buy the proposition that our principal problem related to Pakistan as it relates to Afghanistan is the range of Pakistani tolerance all the way to active support of extremist elements. Uh, if you buy that proposition, I, which I did and I still do, um, then I think it, it, it forces you to realize that we're, we, we are looking for the solution to Pakistan on the wrong border of their country. What drives Pakistani determination to maintain a relationship with extremist elements is about their poisonous relationship with India. Yeah. Um, Americans, I, I learned in the three years I was there that Americans find it very hard to accept this proposition because we think we're the most fascinating people on earth. <laughs> and what America is trying to do in Afghanistan is the most important thing. That I, why don't the Pakistanis get this? The Pakistanis do not believe that Afghanistan or what America is doing in Afghanistan is as fascinating as we do. They, they, they are fascinated by it, but they're far more fascinated totally. by their nuclear armed confrontation and deeply emotional mutual hatred between the Indian uh, and Pakistani population mm -hmm. fed by both governments, as you know. Um, and until 
there is a way, and I, I, I am not smart enough to know how to do this, but until we can find a way, and it, it will take more than just the United States, it would take an international community effort to begin to untie the Gordian knot between India and Pakistan, the, the Pakistanis will never relinquish their relationship with terrorist groups. You're dead on. It's a, it's a unvirtuous cycle. And um, I saw it, I mean, I saw it up close and personal with the anger at the LET bombings and what went on back and forth. And the tragedy of it is, folks, that this is playing into the larger nuclear challenge we face today. I mean, everybody's got to really start to focus. Uh, the last thing we need is another arms race. And the Pakistanis are part of that because they are currently modernizing a completely superior nuclear capacity. That's the irony here. The Pakistanis actually have a superior nuclear capacity to the Indians, but the Indians have a far superior uh, conventional capacity, which is what the Pakistanis fear so much, is, is why they keep thinking they have to grow their nuclear. Uh, I mean, they're at a point now where they have enough deterrence twice over. It's ridiculous, but they're moving in that direction. And that is an agency which I also think operates pretty independently in there without the control directly of the civilian government, et cetera. So it's very dangerous. And um, we all are going to have to try to find a way to get this subject out there again. When I came to the Senate in 1984, I was elected, uh, we were all debating the MX missile and you know, short range in Europe, and there were a whole different debate. But the people in the Senate, we had an arms control observer group that had people like John Warner and Ted Kennedy and Sam Nunn and a whole bunch of really experienced and savvy senators. And, and all of us in the Senate, Al Gore, myself, uh, Tom, we, we spent a lot of time learning about nuclear policy and deterrence. And I, was in, I went to nuclear chemical biological warfare school in, in the Navy. So I learned a fair amount about it to begin with. And I've been intrigued by it. But the truth is that all but two advances in nuclear capacity in the history of the development of nuclear weapons, starting in 1945 when we blew up two bombs, and then the hydrogen bomb, and then you go the distance through silent submarines, long-range bombers, Merving, all the pieces of this. Every single one of them we were first with the exception of two. I forget which two it was. But there were about 20 stages of sort of this kind of development plus. So think about that. We were first. And what drove us was always the notion you're going to outsmart or out-technology your opponent. And that's going to protect you. Every single time our opponent, the Soviet Union, caught up with bigger numbers of SS-18s or whatever it is out there, and we got caught in that arms race because we were sitting there not talking to each other for a long time or totally suspicious and untrusting, which is appropriate. We shouldn't, no, I'm, not, I'm never talking about trusting them, but that's why Reagan said, you know, trust but verify. You got to have a verification structure. So we finally got smart and started to go in a different direction. Now we're coming right back to this mistrust level, automaticity to taking a step to say, oh boy, we can develop a satellite capacity. Well, they're going to knock out our satellites too. We can develop a whatever. It, it just games it in a way that becomes brutally expensive and leads you to the capacity to have an accident or a greater confrontation or spend money you don't need to spend, as the case may be. This is part of the problem with, with President Putin and, and Russia, frankly, is we don't trust them. We know what they're doing to our democracy. We know what they did in, in, in Ukraine and Crimea and so forth, and it's wrong and it breaks law and we were right to stand up to it, et cetera, et cetera. But Putin told George Bush to his face, if you deploy ballistic missile defense in Poland and in you know, Eastern Europe, you're going to affect our sense of what our threat is. And you'll affect our perception that we have deterrence because you could knock down our missiles before they even get out of Europe or whatever, if that's where it was. And, and, and Bush said, you, so he said, Putin said to Bush, if you do this unilaterally, he said, by the way, he also said, let's work on it together. 
Let's jointly develop ballistic missile business. The whole world could benefit from it. And we said, no, we're not going to do that. We don't want to work with you, blah, blah, blah. And it may have been right. I don't know. But the bottom line was that when he said to President Bush, I'm going to have to respond if you do this, Bush said, do what you have to do. That, that's a quote, do what you have to do. So we now see the INF, you know, squeaky. We now see the START Treaty, which I worked to get passed in the Senate, which takes us down, you know, to the 1550, being questioned and, and at risk. And I don't think any of you believe that given the levels of, of, of our capacity today, uh, that it's the moment for us to be unilaterally talking about slickums and, and submarine launch, ballistic missile, and other kinds of things. Maybe I'm wrong, but if we do that unilaterally, folks, we're in an arms race. Just be prepared for it. At a time where I know our military desperately needs funds for a lot of other things that, that we need to be funding uh, more effectively and efficiently in, in order to maintain our state of readiness. And given the budget situation of our nation right now, this is not going to get easier. It's going to get harder. So I just sound the alarm bell to everybody that we really got to look at this question of where we're going in terms of nuclear uh, when we have all these other threats, all the money we need for Afghanistan, all the challenges of development in other parts of the world, deployments through Africa, Middle East, the potential of a war that we could get dragged into. Uh, between Saudi Arabia, Israel, and Iran, the challenge of Iran and Yemen and Hezbollah. That's a big, big playing field. And to do things you don't have to do because you're just kind of cruising off in that direction, I think, is, is pretty dangerous policy. Yeah. Should we go to questions? <clears throat> Will, are you running this show? Wow. <laughs> It's a little scary, isn't it? Hey, sir. Sir, I got a question for you. What do you think we should do with the Kurds in uh, Syria and uh, Iraq and, uh, you know, the, di the dialogue with the Turks? What, uh, let me tell a, a different uh, uh, counterinsurgency ally prophecy besides what happened to me in Afghanistan and India. Because that certainly, that problem can well, it's a tricky one. Sure it is. Look, we, I think we managed it as effectively as you can. We, we went up to the line a few times in terms of our training and work with the YPG and dependence on them to go after ISIL. It was the right strategy. We want, I mean, we did what we needed to do with them. We said we would move out of the communities we moved into. We didn't move out very fast, but we ultimately did. And I think we kept faith with it. But this is a, this is a, I mean, it is viewed as an existential problem by the Turks and by Erdogan. And I've never seen them get as intense as they got on this subject, uh, on any other subject. They, this is really passionate with them. And we've got to be respectful of that. They're a sovereign nation. They're a member of NATO. We have major interests in making sure Turkey is not uh, fully embraced in its uh, new relationship between Iran and Russia. Uh, and therefore, I think we've got to be really, really careful. And that doesn't mean abandoning them at all. It means creating a, a sort of limited understanding with respect to the distance we'll go to. The Turks have got to trust us on that. And frankly, there are a few times where we just went ahead and gambled that they weren't going to be able to Break, and I think they're pissed about that, to be honest with you. So I think we've got to sort of do a little fence mending and try to hold the thing together. The Kurd thing is very, very dangerous in terms of its impact potentially on Iraq and also on a settlement in Syria. Now, I think it's important that we're on the ground. I'm glad we are. I'm glad they know it. I don't think we should unilaterally change that. I think that's part of the bargaining and the leverage for a, a settlement. Uh, and I happen to believe that, you know, there's just a, <laughs> I, I mean, I haven't been saying a lot publicly on this. <clears throat> I ask you all to respect that. But I really believe that there is a deficit with respect to diplomacy in that entire region. And, and you know, Yemen 
We had a proposal on the table, which I left on the table when I left, <clears throat> which Hadi had signed on to. They had all signed on to it. The Saudis had signed on to it. I actually got the Houthi and Saleh to sign a piece of paper to the effect that they were ready to buy into that deal and go to Kuwait and finish this nonsense. And I called the Saudis the night before I met with them in order to get it. And the Saudis said, you were on board. We'll, we're 100% ready to do this. I came to Saudi Arabia to Riyadh the next day with the paper signed and everything done. And Hadi, who was their guest in the country, who has no forces at all, for whom their entire his existence is Saudi Arabia, was allowed to become the problem. And the Saudis said, well, Hadi says he can't do this now. He's not on board. He won't, you know. And frankly, it was just a total walk away. And, and, and uh, in order to allow the continuation of what's happening in Yemen, where I think people, some people still believe in the potential of military victory, which is absolutely not going to happen. Just not going to happen. Uh, people forget that, you know, Gamal Abdel Nasser lost 45,000 Egyptians there uh, in the, what, 50s or 60s, and uh, this is going to go on and on and on. And, and uh, you all know the difficulties we've had in terms of the targeting and the efforts to manage it and so forth. So my feeling you know, is just we've got to be much more strategic, much more engaged, much more involved in leveraging the kind of behavior we, we, we expect from some people, and we're not right now. We've given a free license, a total green light, and that is what is potentially capable of running amok here. Uh, you know, the Saudis are on a you know, very focused strategy with respect to Qatar and, and Iran. And if Bibi starts getting even more focused on that, uh, depending on what Iran chooses to do, this is, to me, far more explosive than any other place right now in the world. Other questions? I have one, sir. So you started your comments about being an advocate for the soft platform and how you were disappointed um, in the time it took to uh, essentially approve it to um, go after ISIL or ISIS, whatever it's being called today. With regard to the overall picture of how we approach uh, foreign terrorist organizations, do you think our current platform takes too long to take action against them, or do you think it would be more effective option to essentially defeat that organization at the grassroots level. So I'm just looking at a Do bigger picture. be more effective what? To, to start to try to defeat them at the grassroots level, so before they start gaining <clears throat> influence. I absolutely believe it's more effective to deal with them at a grassroots level, but that doesn't necessarily mean kinetic to start with. There are other ways to, to deal with them, but yes, we absolutely ought to be engaged in that way, no question about it. And I have a feeling that if we are, and we do it right if we're, if we're thoughtful. I mean, if we really, I think General said this, you know, he didn't understand certain things. Well, none of us did. Uh, you know, we didn't know what we didn't know to some degree in the very beginning of some of these things. But historically, uh, we've had a tendency, not always, but we have a tendency as Americans, all of us, to see other countries and other conflicts through our lens not through the lens of the folks who live there and who, you know, whose country it is. And I think we're getting better, much, much better. And that is what has developed over the last years. We're really getting more sophisticated. These kinds of conferences and other things are helpful in getting us to see where we had a blind spot or where we didn't ask the right questions or where we ignored something. And now we are much, much better. We're still not as, as thoughtful as we might be on some of those things. If we know the politics better in a country, for instance, we know what the history of the players are, <clears throat> and uh, we don't go in and play to uh, the aspirations of the wrong people who use us or who abuse us, uh, we have a much better chance of of perhaps nipping some of those things in the bud before we have to get kinetic. But I wouldn't hesitate personally. I mean, we know they're really bad people there. We know they're affiliated with, I mean, if it's ISIS 3.0, who are now moving into the Philippines, who are moving into some Asian countries, who are in North Africa and places, that's dangerous. And 
that's, those are the folks we got to be able to go after now, and we got to do it fast. And, and I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very supportive of some of the deployments we have that are attempting, basically, to do exactly that. Will. Jonah, thanks so much for being here. Um, assuming we live in an, a world of uh, limited resources, where can we, in, in looking at our existing national security priorities, where do you feel like we can assume some risk? Where are we over-investing? You talked a lot about how we need to be doing more in a variety of different regions. I'm assuming those resources aren't going aren't to come from you know, uh, the ether. We, they, they have to come at the expense of something else. Where, can, where, where would you guys feel comfortable assuming risk that we're currently investing in? Well, Will, I have to tell you, I mean, when I was in the Senate, particularly in the last couple of years, I was on the super committee and I was looking at trying to get a macro deal uh, on our budget that would have dealt with entitlements and tax code and everything, which is really part of the mix of where we have to find the, the balance in our budget which is grossly out of whack right now, and even dangerously more so in the last... I mean, folks, I, I don't... Look, I'm... When I first came to the United States Senate, I voted for the Graham Rudman Hollings Deficit Reduction Act. I mean, I was an early hawk on the deficit as a Democrat, and uh, I led a fair number of people, I think, to that watering hole at that period of time. So I'm not you know, wild ass spending here and there, wherever. And we actually balanced the budget in the 1990s. People forget that. We balanced the budget of the United States in, in, in the 1990s. So we were very, we had Graham Rubin Hollings, we were very responsible about it, we know how to do it. We could balance our budget again. We could get this thing in line and it involves a balance between where you're, you know, specifically choosing to put the money within the, the defense package and the domestic package, et cetera. I'm now five years away from that, and I don't, uh, I'm not current, I want to get current, but I'm not current today in exactly what choices have been made fully within the defense part about that. I know our procurement system is a mess, and all of you know it. We waste, and everybody, you know, people have tried to tackle, we waste unbelievable amounts of money. We duplicate, triplicate, we overspend, we contract badly, we uh, just a whole bunch of problems in, in procurement. And that's the first place I'd start uh, before I get into a weapons system of one kind or another. Um, but then I'd look very, very carefully at uh, a lot of the systems we're using for, are they synced into what we've just talked about for an hour? Do they do the kinds of things that are gonna give you the biggest deterrent increase and the biggest safety margin, or are they want to do things that some particular element of our defense establishment has decided they really want versus what they really need? And I think there are some weapon systems, given what I've described to you today. I don't think we're going to, I just, you know, I, I want to be prepared, but I don't think we're going to see, a, you know, a Warsaw Pact invasion of your, I don't think we're going to see uh, a full-scale naval you know, warfare battle or something. And I think in today's world, with the kind of missiles that we have, a lot of ships aren't going to be floating for long if we do. I mean, I think you've just got to be realistic about what happens if you're really getting into the war gaming. Of, and you all have done that, and so have I. And you see how quickly things go into a pretty difficult place. Um, so I'd look at those very carefully and begin to judge. I want people on the ground in places, doing the diplomacy, doing the developing, doing the governance assistance, and doing the kinetic pieces we've talked about here that take out bad guys when, when that's the only thing you can do. And that's the best deterrent there is. If people see that the United States of America, together with Europe, I mean, I think that's one of the salutary things of what we've done in Afghanistan. How, how, you remember coming to Brussels, I think? Sure did. How many people do we have? We had 50 some nations around that table. All of them committed. Some not with, you know, frontline forces on the ground, but with things we needed to make it all work. They were the hospitals, or they were the training, or they were doing the policing, or whatever it was. But that's, the, that's what we need. And if people see us determined, to follow through and get that done. That has a very powerful message in building the diplomatic piece, the development piece, the other pieces that make it work. 
And I'm for putting, I'd be fighting hard to get more of the resources there rather than into some of these 10 year away, highly technological, unbelievably you know, complicated and expensive systems that might go out with the first satellite that goes out or the first cyber attack that takes place. I mean, you talk about a threat, cyber, 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 folks. Uh, the, whole, the whole system can come down if, if somebody's uh, yeah. as astute as some of these teams are on the ground that are wreaking havoc uh, nowadays. So cyber bothers me a lot more than some of the other potential things, scenarios you see written out. And we've got to factor that in far more effectively. Yeah, I, if we got to save money in DOD, I'd start by taking active duty officers at grad school and putting them on half pay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> seems small, it would make me feel good now. Um, I, I completely agree with the Secretary. And that would hurt our beer budget. Exactly. <laughs> But I agree with him, but I would add something as well. A lot of what we used in Iraq and Afghanistan wasn't developed until we were in Iraq and Afghanistan. Remember MRAPs and whatnot, unmanned aerial vehicles, some other things. And so I really think we're at a time where equipment's not going to be developed. The technology's not going to be developed in the military over a long time and then go to commercial uses. It's the opposite now. It's, it's commercial. So I, I would invest on people because I think, you know, what we've talked about, developing skills and familiarity. And then I would try to set up our development process so we can sort of wait and see what, what's happening and then start producing stuff. There's some risk in that. But I actually think with processes to build things now and whatnot, the risk would not be crazy. I mean, you have to have certain things, but I, but I would wait and see because I think swarming UAVs, rail guns, high energy labor, or lasers, a lot of what we have is going to prove not useful. But we don't know which. And, and even Wargaming doesn't tell you yet. I think you're going to kind of get in it and you go, well, guess what? We need more of this. And so we need to be set up to how do you build more of that as quickly as you can with the, with the product improvements. And I don't think any other country right now could compete with us doing that. China will be able to. But uh, I, I think that's the right approach. Sir. Gentlemen, thank you for your comments today. Uh, my name is Lieutenant Colonel uh, Brian Price from the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point. Both of you have spent um, ridiculous amounts of time with senior leaders from, from other countries. And so when you talk about some of the most important uh, leaders that uh, the United States have, may have played a hand in, in putting in power, I'm talking about people like uh, President Karzai and, and Prime Minister uh, Nouriel Maliki, only for us later to have a little, maybe a little bit of buyer's remorse in terms of how they centralized power and, and uh, led corrupt governments. And so when I look back at our own history and when we were a nascent democracy, I think there are times when we may have been more lucky than good uh, because when we started out, our organizations, our um, institutions were, were similarly a mess. We had pe leaders like George Washington that were able to uh, take our country when, they, when we had inflection points. And so given the backdrop that, you know, moving forward, there might be some more cases where we might uh, play a role in putting leaders into countries, uh, whether you take Syria or potentially North Korea and others. Have we picked the wrong horses in these countries uh, for these leaders? When I, when I say picked, back supported at least initially, or do you think that those two individuals were put into uh, situations where the, the environment itself made it impossible for any leader to, uh, to lead their countries the way we would like them to? Well, Mars Remoris is not reserved to other countries. <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> we, we don't do it perfectly either. Uh, and I'm not just referring, I mean, through history. Winston Churchill has said that uh, democracy is the worst form of government in the world, except for everything else. And I think that's true. Uh, I, 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 I love democracy, and I would always fight for it, die for it, but it ain't working very well right now here. It's broken. And it's broken because we have a fundamentally financi financing system that is that's corrupt. I, mean, I don't know how to call it otherwise. It, it imprisons the agenda of our nation, folks. 
It's not that the money always gets what it wants. It doesn't. I'm not suggesting that. And I'm not suggesting there's a trade and a buy in. It's, when I say corrupted, it's in a writ large sense that I'm talking about. It, it sets the agenda. The average American, their voice does not have the same ability to get to the halls of power and, and get a bill on the floor or get a special page in the tax code. I often went out to my constituents in Massachusetts and I asked them, I say, how many of you have your own page in, in the tax code? And of course, I mean, not a hand would go up. But I've got news for you. There are plenty of entities that have their own pages in thousands, tens of thousands of pages of the tax code where they have a carve out that means they don't pay or whatever. Americans know this. I mean, Americans, this is why we have this growing sort of populist, uh, nativist reaction in the country because they don't see the, the Washington develop, the delivering. And in fact, what you had in the last campaign was effectively a hostile takeover of the Republican Party. And it came about because first you had the Gingrich Revolution, which I remember very well in the 90s, and, and it didn't deliver. Remember, Roe v. Wade was going to go away. Tax reform was going to happen. A smaller government was going to be delivered. None of those things happened. But then it didn't happen with the next round, which was the Tea Party. And then it didn't happen with the next round, which was the Freedom Caucus. And that's why we are where we are. People are rightfully angry because we ain't delivering. So we have a problem here in our own country. We have a gerrymandered Congress. You cannot have a legitimate general election in America in which the average person could go out and challenge a member of Congress and have a fair race. We have a carve out for, by parties. And that's the Supreme Court just decided one case in, in favor of changing it, fixing it. And there's another case coming, I think from Wisconsin or somewhere, and who knows where they come down. But that would do more to resuscitate democracy in our country than a lot of other things I can think about. Now, I could go on, but I'm just, I'm just saying to you that it was really hard as Secretary of State. I'd walk into a, a meeting with somebody, and my talking points, you know, hey, Mr. Prime Minister, you really got to get your budget together. And I could just see it go, you know, so look at me like, where are you coming from? Uh, you know, you got to have clean hands and credibility to deliver some of these messages. So we're, we're handicapping ourselves a little bit in that regard. Now, that said, um, it's not a good idea to be picking people in any country. We should get that out of our heads. Doesn't work. It's gone back. I mean, go back in history of the last century, folks, in Latin America, and you're in Asia, Diem and Vietnam. I mean... We, we, we shouldn't be picking people. First of all, it's against our value system to be doing that that way, especially some of the ways we've chosen to do it. Look what we did in Iran. 1953, Kermit Roosevelt. We took a, you know, with the CIA. He was the head of the CIA, and we got rid of Mossadegh, who was the, uh, you know, Democratic prime minister of a country. Okay. Replaced him with the Shah, and then we got the revolution in 79, and we're still living with the implications of all of that and the intensity of that. So I am not for us trying to pick a leader in a country. And to some degree, frankly, I mean, again, I'm not excusing anything. I mean, Putin's invasion of our democracy is, is an act of war. It's completely unacceptable, and he ought to pay a huge price for it and, and, and so forth. But Putin, I know this, believes that Hillary Clinton and America tried to interfere in his election. And our ambassador was regularly meeting, as we do, with the opposition in the embassy in, in Moscow. And they interpreted that as America giving guidance to the opposition as to how to beat him. And you know they listened to it, whatever the conversation was. So I, we got to be really careful. That's all I'm suggesting is that, uh, you know, and by the way, if any kind of regime change took place in, uh, in North Korea, I assure you, uh, it ain't going to be us making a choice. It's going to be China. Uh, so let's not delude ourselves about the facility with which that might or might not take place or whether it's going to happen. Um, I don't see that as, and by the way, the more chatter there is about that, the harder it's going to be to get a solution to the crisis on the peninsula uh, because that's part of what he fears. He thinks we are out for regime change and he needs a nuclear deterrent in order to prevent it from happening. If you look at Gaddafi, you probably ask, 
the same question of yourself. So I hope our policies will encourage democracy, encourage our values, human rights, stand up as we must and should for, uh, for what defines America and our influence in the world and which has made a difference to the Lequilenses and the Vaclav Havels and the people historically through Voice of America, et cetera. All fair game, we should be doing that. But the people are going to decide in that country who their Democrat's going to be. And that's the way it's going to be the strongest and most successful for us, I think. Yeah, you taint a leader if there's a, a sense that we caused them to be in there. They're much better for us if everybody thinks they didn't. You know, they did it themselves. It, it just comes out long term better. I think we're out of time. We got one time, one more? All right. Better be great. <laughs> Do my best, sir. Dylan, thank you for your time. Uh, Captain Thatcher Merrill from 10th Special Forces. Uh, my question uh, kind of refers to what Secretary Kerry was just speaking to. Uh, many of us have, in watching Russia and IS the last couple of years, uh, come to understand the true power of covert influence campaigns. Uh, my question is, uh, can and should the U.S. engage in covert influence on a large scale? Uh, can we prevail over the narratives of uh, violent extremism and autocracy without doing so? And if so, how? Well, I support covert activity. I, I support covert. I believe that some things you have to do through covert operations. And uh, the best thing you can do is keep them covert. <laughs> yeah, I, let me add on that. Covert, however, is seductive opportunity, you know, particularly a new administration comes in and, and the, the new president says, how do I solve this problem? And he gets 100,000 men from the military and $50 billion, and then he gets this very small, sexy thing, we're just going to do this, and it's going to cause it. And it'll always be secret. One, it usually doesn't work, and it's never secret in the long term. And so I, I support covert action strongly, but you've got to be very mature about it. And if you think it's the easy button, it's usually not. And then particularly to your point about covert influence, that's another case where I do think we should use it, but we should use it with caution. Because again, it will likely not stay truly uh, covert forever. And so if we are start to be perceived as people who are not purveyors of the truth, and we are doing this stuff, then everything we do will be discounted. So the idea of Radio, radio Free Europe and things like that was powerful, the BBC during World War II, if people thought that that was actually accurate. And so I think that we need to think that way. I'm not saying there aren't instances where you wouldn't, you know, put something that would be a clever trick on somebody, but you got to really think that through. Could I underscore that with one comment to everybody here? Whoever is in a position of making a decision in policy, whether it's domestic, foreign, military, or not. There's a phrase that I now always ask myself, no matter what the decision is, and it's just three words, and then what? Ask yourself, and then what? If you can't answer that, you've got a problem. And too often, it's like Afghanistan, then what? You've got to ask the question, and then what? And, if the, and then what works out? And you're, you're prepared to take whatever that consequence is, but you've got to know what it's going to be. Perfect. Please join me in a round of applause. Thank you. Thanks,